Good. Everybody on board? Okay. All right, let's continue then. Um, yeah, so as I said, we're going to look specifically tonight at children and baptism, or as it's commonly referred to as infant baptism, which I think is just an unfortunate thing that it has to kind of get its own like subcategory, like this is its own thing, um, when it really should just be baptism. And when you look back and review at all of the blessings and all of the gifts that God promises to give those who are baptized, the answer or the, the question really should answer itself. Why do you baptize babies? Because of everything that God promises to give through it. This is what we want to give to our children. Um, but I realize that there's there's more kind of aspects to the question. Um, and, and this really, I think, is what makes uh, baptism, uh, if, if I can say, um, offensive to some people, even to Christians. It's that we would even baptize children. And so I think it probably does deserve its own conversation. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, if you look at the, the paragraphs that are on the middle of page 65, one common question about baptism that arises among Christians is whether or not little children and infants should be baptized. Some say there is no biblical reason not to baptize children. Others suggest that little children and infants should not be baptized because they can't understand what baptism is all about. Our practice, uh, that is not just the practice of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, not just of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, but of the confessional Lutheran Church, and really the vast majority of Christendom throughout its history, I would say, um, uh, is to baptize children. Historically, infants and children have always been baptized in the Christian Church. Only in recent centuries has this practice been questioned. This blew my mind a couple years ago. When I had a, a woman sitting in this very class, uh, and this is kind of what 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 uh, necessitated that that worded uh, that wording there, is she came to me uh, kind of from a I don't remember exactly Baptist background, non-denominational one uh, a background that does not baptize children, and she said my pastor told me that uh, infant baptism didn't start until Martin Luther, and that he's the one who started it, and so it's kind of a Lutheran thing. Um, and, and I'm just like, I had never heard that in my entire life. That is absolutely false. Um, it's not just a Lutheran thing. It's not something Martin Luther, um, started. In fact, it's the exact opposite that it really wasn't until the time of the Lutheran Reformation and shortly after that on a larger scale, infant baptism was even questioned. So it's not that the Lutheran Reformation started baptism. It was actually during and shortly after the Reformation that infant baptism was starting to be questioned. Now, I'm not saying that there were not people in previous centuries that questioned it. They did. Um, but it really is the, the, the growth of what became known as the Anabaptists, which really has kind of led into um, um, uh, Baptist, right? Um, uh, Anabaptist, I don't know why they dropped that. Uh, Anabaptist is Greek for to, to rebaptize or to baptize again. And the, the whole reason why that, that movement got started is because everybody was baptized as an infant, as a baby, and they said, no, you need to be rebaptized now as an adult. And that, so that began the whole Anabaptist movement. And that was shortly after the Reformation. So it's actually the exact opposite. So if you've ever had a pastor or anyone tell you, that Martin Luther and the Lutheran Reformation is when we started baptizing babies. Um, it's actually the exact opposite. Um, and here are just a couple of examples I want to share with you um, to, to kind of show that to you. Um, a couple quotes uh, from some ancient church fathers, Origen uh, from Alexandria in Egypt. You see his dates there down below uh, said this, the church received from the apostles the tradition to give even little children to baptism. Okay. Um, another one. This is Hippolytus uh, from uh, Rome. He wrote, uh, first, you should baptize the little ones. All who can speak for themselves should speak. 
But for those who cannot speak, their parents should speak, or another who belongs to their family. Um, and this is why you see even this. I don't just take a baby up to the front and baptize them. The parents come up with them because it is the parents who bring them to be baptized, who speak on behalf of the child. You have godparents and sponsors sometimes who are a part of that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that practice um, later on. Uh, next one. Oh, oh, I did that backwards. Okay. Uh, Bishop Phytus at the Council of Carthage. This is around 250 AD. Um, the question, one of the main questions that was asked at this council. Now, again, you look back through history. Um, some of these councils were um, uh, major turning points and important events in the history of Christianity. So, you know, uh, on Sunday morning, we confess the Nicene Creed, right? You, you think of the council at Nicaea. Um, this is where that creed came out of 325 AD um, because a major heresy that was growing throughout Christianity was the fact that people said, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not true God. Um, they also rejected and denied that Jesus is true God and true man in one person. And so when, when stuff started to kind of grow, right, when, when heresy started to attack the Christian church, some of the Christians got together and said, hey, we need to make sure we're all on the same page that we're still, you know, confessing and teaching what the Bible says. And so these councils, um, while not not super co uh, common, were common enough. And, and this is one of the questions that was addressed at the Council of Carthage. Should we wait uh, to baptize until the eighth day? Now, why would they ask that question in that way? What, what connection did they see, does the Bible even make, between baptism and the eighth day? What was done for, for the people in biblical times on the eighth day? Circumcision, Circumcision right? This is the commandment that God gave to Abraham, um, that this is how uh, Israelite boys were, were going to be marked as, as children and offspring of the promise of Abraham. Um and so New Testament Christians saw this. They, they see the connection that the Apostle Paul even makes in the Bible. Um, and they ask this question then, okay, so New Testament is really kind of the, not, not just the re New Testament replacement, but baptism is, is now, it supersedes circumcision, right? That ceremonial law. Um, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul even, you know, talks a lot about this in, in Romans and Galatians about how um, circumcision is merely an outward thing, right? Um, and, and baptism is something that supersedes that now. Um, and yet the connection is there for various reasons. And so they asked the question, well, circumcision was done on the eighth day. So should we, we, should we wait to baptize children until they're eight days old? Now notice, the question is not eight months or eight years they're asking, should we wait until eight days to baptize our children? And the answer they give is this. Grace may not be legitimately withheld from anyone who has been born. So the answer is, should we wait until the eighth day? No. Right? Um, and, and, and so uh, they, they see this again. They see baptism, grace as being imparted on this. Now, a couple of aspects, though, I, I just want to touch on here because we won't get into them really anywhere else. Is there there are two connections really that there that the the Bible notes between circumcision and baptism, and I think they're very interesting to point out. And this connection, um, well, really three connections I would say um, between baptism and circumcision, and. Um, Again, I mentioned that that baptism is one that now not just replaces circumcision, but supersedes it, right? Circumcision was part of the, the law, right? It was a command. Um, and, and yet here we've got baptism is now this kind of God doing this imparting. Paul will talk about how um, you and I have been circumcised. And it was actually part of the, the text for the sermon on Sunday, but I didn't really touch on it. Um, Paul talks about how we are circumcised not of the flesh, not with human hands, right? 
Um, this is all a picture of faith, of being born again, being adopted into the family of God. And so um, this picture of uh, connection between circumcision and baptism is one that says um, baptism is now the mark that you are born again into the family of God. Okay, so um, what you oftentimes see, um, and maybe you've never noticed this, and maybe you'll forget it after tonight, and that's fine. But what you'll oftentimes see when you go to a Christian church is that a lot of Christian baptismal fonts are octagonal in shape. They have eight sides to it. Um, and ours, though it's a bowl there, there's eight legs underneath it. And then the top part that you really can't see, um, I'll tip it here. This top part that says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, also has eight sides. And so A was the connection to circumcision, but it was also the, the connection to Easter. Um, and Easter is oftentimes referred to as the eighth day. And the reason for that is because if you think back into creation, right, you've got the first week of creation, Sunday through Saturday. And on that seventh day, God rested from his work. Um, Sunday is the day then that that uh, our Easter Sunday is the day that creation is renewed. It's reborn because Jesus dies and rises again. All of creation, right, is, is renewed. Um, and so what is Easter Sunday? It's viewed as being the eighth day of the week, right? It's the first day of everlasting life. It's the first day of new life and, and renewal and regeneration. Um, and so what is our baptism? But it is that which, um, as we looked at last week in Romans 6, baptism is that which connects us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so what is your baptism? It is your eighth day. It's your resurrection. It is your rebirth. It is your renewal. Um, it's your connection to Jesus forever. Um, the last thing, uh, the connection for the, the number eight in baptism is um, because of the passage that we looked at last time in 1 Peter chapter 3, um, where, where Peter makes the connection between the flood and baptism. And the connection uh, of eight in the flood is what? Eight, eight people. people were saved in the ark, right? Noah and his wife their three sons and their wives. So eight people in the ark. So the connection between baptism and the number eight is one that, that has been kind of around a long time for Christianity. So again, not that, you know, it's not going to be on any quiz or anything, not because I don't give you any quizzes, uh, but just, you know, some, I, I find that stuff fascinating. Maybe you do too. All right. Um, so again, those are just a couple of examples um, throughout history that, that shows us this is not a new thing. This is not even a 15th century Lutheran Reformation thing. Um, but we've got already in the earliest eras and stages of the Christian church saying, yeah, we, we give our babies to baptism. Okay. So this is the traditional historical practice of the Christian church. However, I note in that second paragraph, middle of page 65, our historic customs are not the best way to determine what is correct. So I'm not telling you, well, because Christians have always done this, this is why we do this. That's not a good enough reason. It's not a good enough reason to really do anything. Okay. Um, the best place to find the answer to this question, like every matter of faith, is in the Bible. So what reasons for baptizing infants do you find in these verses? And again, if anybody has any questions during this, just stop me, let me know, um, and, uh, and we'll address them. Or I'll tell you, we'll, we'll get to that um, coming up shortly. The first verse is one that we've already looked at now multiple times. Matthew 28, 19, right? Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the, the question I have then here is this. Who does Jesus intend to leave out of baptism with these words? So, so you can look at this in kind of a positive way and say, okay, Jesus is saying, go and make disciples of all nations. Great. This is why we do world missions. 
This is why we take the message of the gospel overseas. This is why we reach into any and every community that will, that will allow us, and some even that don't, um, because God wants disciples of all nations. Correct. And, and, and the discipling happens by baptizing. But again, I would say, bring it back to this question, who does Jesus intend to leave out of baptism? This is the Great Commission. This is the institution of baptism. This is the, the passage um, when it comes to what does Jesus say about baptism? This is why we still baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and, 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 and looking at this passage, we, we say, Jesus says all, and all means all. Um, and, and, and you can add to that, if somebody wants to talk about uh, age of discretion or age of accountability, um, if you want to talk about human or man-made traditions, find me something in the Bible that talks about those. Find me something in the Bible that talks about don't do this until the age of accountability or the age of discretion or the age of reason. It's not in there. Um, and, and so I would say that it kind of gives way more to the this is a is a human tradition as opposed to following the mandate of Jesus. Now, maybe some people say here, um, you know, the idea that uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Um, so the it seems like the idea here is you make disciples and then you baptize them. But, but again, I would say, go back to what we talked about last week in our class, where we're, we're st stop trying to separate and order the things that are said. And, and it's easy to do that here in the English, but in the Greek, it's impossible. And here's why. Because a literal translation of this verse says, Jesus says, go and disciple all the nations, baptizing them. So the verb, the only verb in this verse is to disciple. It's not to, to make disciples. Um, the, the, the verb there is, is, is um, from uh, the, the verb to, to teach. Um, so the, the King James Version, um, if some of you remember this, says, Go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them. Um, so the, the, the point here being, how is it that someone is, is discipled? How is it that someone is taught? Um, you do that through baptism, right? So again, in English, I can see how you would kind of, you know, maybe be able to break this apart. We've got to make disciples and then we've got to baptize them. But again, the, the Greek just simply says, no, this is, this is, this is all done together. You, you baptize and in baptizing, you're discipling, you're making disciples, you're teaching. Um, and so uh, really when it comes to what is the, the word disciples is not the antecedent for any of you language buffs out there. The word disciples is not the antecedent of the pronoun them. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Um, disciples is not the, the antecedent. Um, the antecedent is all nations, because disciples in this verse in the Greek is not a noun. It's a verb. So the them is the is what is referring to all nations, baptizing them, who? Not the disciples, not the ones who have somehow, you know, gotten to this point of, um, of uh, educational level or an age of whatever, um, but it is go teach all nations, baptizing them, oh, baptizing all all nations, okay? Um, the second one there in, um, is from Acts chapter two. And, and for my money, this, is, this for me is the slam dunk. Um, this is the verse that I look at and go, I just don't know how you get around this, okay? This is kind of the, the second part of the Apostle Peter's Pentecost Day sermon. Um, and, and remember he, 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 he can um, he convicts the people there in Jerusalem of of crucifying the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. This is who he is, and you killed him. Um, and we're told that the people were cut to the heart. Um, and and Peter replies with this. He says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So the question is, in verse 39, what promise is Peter talking about? What promise is he making then? The forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And how does the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit come to these people? Repent and be baptized, right? And if somebody wants to say, okay, but here's the problem, repent. How do little children repent? Um, I, I would say this too um, is something in the same line that we talked with in, in the when it comes to the matters of faith is something that God actually does in you. God repents you. Um, God is the one who turns you. Uh, number one. Number two, um, this is 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 an example of something that is charged and asked of parents to also do and confess on behalf of their children. Um, uh, for those of you who have not had the, the privilege yet, one of the most intimidating and terrifying moments of your life, um, and I pray that, that, that God gives you this ability someday, will be the day um, that uh, someone hands you a baby and says, okay, you're free to take him or her home now. What? Yeah. You're entrusting this child. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, we, we've never even so much as babysat a child, and now you're giving one to us, and we're just supposed to go home and take care of it. There's nothing more ter terrifying or intimidating in your life than that very moment. Um, and you think the people at the hospital should be arrested for even allowing you to do that. Um, and yet, what is it? This is how God provides for children. Um, God wants children fed and protected and loved and provided for. And so he entrusts them to parents. And guess what happens the first, I don't know how many years of their life before they start to speak. You don't wait for them to ask for things you know are good for them. If you wait for a child to ask you to feed it, it will die. If you wait for a child to ask for you to bathe it, it will die. If you wait for a child to ask you to clothe it, it will die. You do those things because you're not a baby and you know better. And so this is why God entrusts children to parents. And so here it is, repent and be baptized. So what is one of the things that parents do when they bring their children to baptism? They repent for the child. They confess for the child. They say for all of the awful and sinful things that we've done in this life, Bringing this child into the world and, 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 and having this child, this too is a part of our brokenness, our sinfulness. As beautiful and amazing as a gift as this is, the, the worst of us have also been um, put into this child. And we'll look at that in our second part. Um, so repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children. And then, what do we see twice later on in the book of Acts? Two people were told, Lydia and the jailer at Philippi, both in the city of Philippi, we are told um, adults, they are instructed, they are converted, and they and their whole households are baptized. Now, I don't like it when people who are pro-infant baptism jump right to those verses and say, see, an entire household was baptized, therefore you baptize children. That's a weak argument. But I think knowing that Peter says this here at the beginning of Acts, and, 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 and then it, it kind of addresses when some people say, well, if God wanted us to baptize children, why wasn't he more explicit about it? I say, I don't know how you can get more explicit than this, Acts chapter 2, and then later on in the same book, you see that entire households were baptized. 
Now, I'm not saying I know the ages of those people, but I think the simple fact that we are told their entire household was baptized coming on the heels of Peter saying, this is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. I, I, I think it's intended there then to say that this is clear. Right? Because it all comes back to Matthew 28, 19, baptize all. Okay. All right. So what is our reason then uh, for why we baptize infants and children? Simply put, because children are a part of all nations. As our adults, as our elderly people, as uh, every generation of every culture, every civilization that has ever, you know, lived is a part of this. Okay. Number two, why do we baptize children? This is kind of the, the, the sad one I was referencing earlier. Genesis 8 verse 21, every inclination of a person's heart is evil from childhood. Um, and I mentioned this all the way back, I think, in lesson four on the fall into sin. Um, God speaks this to Noah in the context of the flood. And I always like asking the question, do you think this is something that um, that uh, God spoke to Noah before the flood or after the flood? And it seems like this would be something that God spoke before the flood, which is why the why God carried out the flood. But this is part of God's promise when he puts the rainbow in the sky. And he says, this is my promise that I will never again destroy the world in such a way, even though every inclination of a person's heart is evil from childhood. The flood did not cure that. It did not rid the world of a sinful nature. Okay? Um, this is what we pass on to our children. Similarly, King David said this, Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And, and people say, um, I've heard people say, well, this is just David's personal confession. He's not applying it to anyone else. And I say, well, the Bible also says that David was a man after the Lord's own heart. Doesn't really say that about anybody else in the Bible. Um, so if that's what is true about a man after the Lord's own heart, what does it say about me? <laughs> um, so, no, this is a, 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 a universal confession that David is making. Finally, in John 3, this is Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, the, the man who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, the Pharisee. We talked a little bit about this passage last time um, where Jesus said, um, uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. This is the very next verse. Here's why. Here's why you need to be born again of water and the spirit, because flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Um, and so I always encourage people, I don't think I've ever had anyone take me up on this, but I always encourage people, stop celebrating your birthday. Because your birthday marks the day that you were born to die. That's what started. And if you and I knew what day we were going to die, um, we would all carry around watches that counted down. That's how we do things, right? We count up, we, we mark our years, I'm a year older, because we don't know. And so we count from our birth. But if we knew when we were going to die, we would count down, I guarantee it. Because this is what we do. Um, your, your physical birth into this world marked the day that you were born to die. Your baptismal day is the day that marked the day that you were born to never die again. That's a day to celebrate. That's a day that you should remember every single year and make a huge deal of your baptismal birthday. Um, again, I don't know that I've ever had anybody take me up on it, um, but I would highly encourage it. Um, find out the day that you were baptized. Make that a special day um, because that is the day that marked you for everlasting life. Okay. So flesh gives birth to flesh. Um, we talk, I talked about this in the sermon a little bit on Sunday. Sarks is that word. The sinful nature gives birth to a sinful nature. Um, but the spirit gives birth to spirit, right? Being born again of water and the spirit is different than being born flesh from flesh, right? Um, so second reason, why do we baptize infants and children? Because children are born sinful. 
Um, to state it positively, as I did earlier, children need the blessings promised in baptism. If children are naturally sinful and baptism distributes and gives the forgiveness of sins, then what are we talking about? If, if my physical birth into this world marks me for death, and being born again in water and the spirit marks me for everlasting life, then what are we talking about? Okay? One more reason. And I think this is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, and when, when people struggle with infant baptism, it's not so much infant baptism as much as I think it is. They struggle with the concept of infants believing. Um, babies cannot believe, which to me is the easiest one to refute because we have numerous passages in the Bible which speak to the contrary, okay? Here are just a couple of them. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Jesus says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, and the, the Greek word here, all of these verses, they all use different words for infants, babies. Um, and the word here for little ones is the Greek word um, micro. Um, no one's really around my age, but when I was a kid, the hot toy was micro machines. Um, they were tiny little cars um, and you they would have like little ramps and things you could do with them. And they had the guy in the commercial that talked like a thousand words a minute. That was kind of the selling point, the micro machine guy. Um, what is a micro of something? It's not an adolescent. It's not a teenager. It's not a prepubescent young one. A micro something is a tiny, microscopic something. So what is a micro human being? Jesus is talking about the littlest, the tiniest of human beings. And what does Jesus say? Who believe in me? If anyone causes one of these micro ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Um, there is the weight of parenthood. Um, sadly, we think that the pressure and the stress of being a parent is to make sure that our kids get on all the right sports teams and get into the right schools and, you know, head down the right career path and all of those things. When the reality is, um, the most important charge given to you as a parent is this, is to lead your children to Jesus. Um, and, and so um, here's the charge that Jesus gives, right? Who believe in me? Crystal clear. Here's another one. Second Timothy chapter three. Um, Paul writes this uh, to Timothy. He says, from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Greek word there is brephos. Um, and, and brephos is the Greek word that is used when you are talking about even children who are still in the womb. The Greek word for unborn children is brephos. Um, and so um, what is Paul saying? You have known the Holy Scriptures um, since the earliest, earliest days of your life. Um, and, and, and Paul talks about how Timothy's mom and his grandma taught him the faith. It's a really cool picture. Um, a multi-generational um, catechizing of, of, of Timothy. Um, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Um, we get a picture of this when um, Mary, pregnant with Jesus, goes to visit her relative Elizabeth, who's pregnant with Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And what does Elizabeth say? How am I so highly favored that the mother of my Lord would come to visit me? For just at the sound of your voice, Mary, the baby inside my womb leapt for joy. What is that? How from infancy you have known. And so I, I tell mothers who are pregnant, you know, um, I've had some who are, are you know, um, the, the beauty and the comfort of, of baptism 
um, is there for parents, but sometimes it creates an unnecessary stress. Pastor, what if my, ba my baby doesn't make it to baptism? What if my baby is stillborn? Um, what, what if, what if uh, you know, something happens before we can baptize it? Um, be the word. Be in church. Hear the word. You know, in the same way that, you know, that they show that, 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 that uh, babies inside the, the tummies of their mom can tell and differentiate mom's voice from everybody else's, um, so too, how much more the voice of Jesus, the working of the Holy Spirit, right? Be in the word. Make sure that, that as much as your children recognize your voice, they recognize the voice of their good shepherd. Right? Um, thirdly, then, uh, one more. Mark 10. Jesus said to, to his disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. If someone wants to say little children can't believe, then I, I don't understand why Jesus would make such a big deal about encouraging and highlighting childlike faith. <laughs> He's always talking about it. And here it is, right? Um, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So if you're going to tell me that little kids, babies even, cannot believe, then you're saying one of two things. Number one, they cannot be saved. And I don't think anybody is saying that least any Christian. Then the only other option is this. Then you are saying that children are saved apart from Jesus Christ. I don't know of any Christian who would want to say either. But in saying children can't believe, you necessarily have to say one or the other. Or both. I don't know. Well, no, you can't say both. One is condemned, one is saved, right? Um, so the, the, the last reason that we would have here is why do we baptize infants and children? Because children can believe. It's all through the scriptures. Uh, I mean, um, I heard somebody put it to me once this way, and, and this is kind of the same thing, but a little different. Um, someone said, Pastor, um, Baptism is, and, and this was a, a, mis, a, a mistake on their part, I would say, a misunderstanding of baptism, but this was essentially their question. They said, Pastor, baptism is entering into a legal agreement. If you're not willing to let your baby enter into a legal contract, then you should not allow your child to be baptized. And I said, what kind of contract are we talking about? And they said, well, a, a business deal or to, you know, finance a home or, you know, like a, a, a legal contract. And I said, what about adoption? That's a legal contract. Should we let children enter into that legal contract? I would hope so. Um, even though that baby might not have any idea what's going on. Um, it is entering into a legal contract. I am your child and you are my parents. This is my family. Um, and, and what it reminds us of is this. All children, babies, infants can do. All they can do is be served, be taken care of, and receive gifts. That's all babies can do. So is it any wonder then that Jesus says, if anyone would not have faith like a child, you're never going to enter the kingdom of God. Because what is the only way that we enter into the kingdom of God? 
It is to admit that the only thing we can do, God, is to be served, to be taken care of, to receive your gifts. We are helpless infants. All we can do is, is be given what you would give us. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to have my child enter into a, a legal contract that involves their responsibility of holding up some bargain or that they're going to have to invest some money. Um, but there's a reason also why then later on the Apostle Paul makes a big point about talking about how you and I as Christians are adopted into the family of God. Because this is the picture. Because naturally we are born outside the family of God. And so if we are going to be children of God, then it is only going to be because he has chosen to adopt us into his family. And I remember thinking to myself for the longest time when I read that, being a natural born child and, and growing up with and knowing kids who were adopted and not knowing how that dynamic worked, I thought to myself, to be a natural born child um, is better than being adopted. So how sad is it that we are not naturally born into the family of God, but adopted? It makes me feel like a second class child in the family of God. Um, number one, well, there's no other way. Because if I was naturally born into the family of God, then I wouldn't need Jesus. And I do. But number two, I had a pastor tell me this once, and I, I thought it was the greatest thing. He said, remember that there are no unplanned adoptions. There are plenty of unplanned pregnancies. There are plenty of natural children that sadly are not planned and are not wanted. But nobody wakes up one morning and goes, holy cow, there's a kid running around our house and we somehow adopted him and I have no idea when, where, or how that happened. You have to want to adopt that child. Um, you have to love that child before you enter, welcome it into your family. Do you see the picture and the beauty and the comfort then of why this is being adopted into the family of God? Stop thinking about yourself like a second class child, Pastor Bader. God wanted you in his family. He chose you as part of his family. And the adoption came through baptism. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, that's kind of a, a good place to, um, well, let's do this. Because I think maybe this will, there'll be some, some questions still. Um, so turn the page, top of page 68. And then this will kind of end our section on, on infant baptism. Um, have you ever planted tomato seeds? Um, or any other kind of seeds, what would happen to a little tomato plant that has just sprouted if you put it in a closet at the beginning of May and didn't open the closet door again to look at it until September? The same truth applies to the faith that sprouts in baptism. We know that the Holy Spirit uses baptism to create faith, to forgive our sins, and to bring us into Christ's family. This is as true for little children as it is for adults. However, we also need to remember that baptism is not a magic charm. The faith created and given in baptism needs to be nurtured through regular contact with the word of God. And so the biggest thing that I tell parents when they bring their children to, to have them baptized is recognize this is not your last duty as Christian parents. This is really your first duty as Christian parents. Um, and, and we didn't look at it um, so much, but, but, but follow the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if, if people want to talk about, you know, um, here's this and this, and the order is important, well, Matthew 28, 19 says you baptize and then you teach. You baptize children, and then you teach them what that baptism means. I'm not going to say that, but if you want to go down that road, right, um, that, that the order is everything that matters, okay then, right? Well, then you got to include this one. 
What I'm saying is, this is the same thing we do for our children in every matter of life. You do the things for your children that you know are good for them. You subject them to the things that you are going to be beneficial for them long before they ever understand how and why they are beneficial to them. And as they grow older, then you teach them, this is why we do this. This is why it's beneficial. This is why we're always talking about this. This is why we go to church. This is why we read the Bible. This is why we have family devotions. Because this is the faith that was given to you at your baptism. And now we're growing it and we're strengthening it. Paul makes this point as he talks about kind of our growth as Christians, right? He says, we all start on spiritual milk. But you can't stay on spiritual milk forever. And, and, and not that it's addressed there, but I think you can make the application. Baptism is the spiritual milk. But you can't just look at it and go, okay, we had our kid baptized, now that's it. And it's going to be this, this little, you know, sunshine that's going to shine over them the whole rest of their life, even though we're never going to bring them back to Jesus. We're never going to give them the word of God. We're never going to teach them the faith that was given to them in their baptism. We're never going to follow this up with any instruction because we baptized them. We did the thing. We got grandma off our back and we're done. Um, no, this is the beginning of your role as Christian parents. Okay. Um, and, and I know that, you know, as your kids get older and as they become adults, right. And, and I know a lot of adult parents struggle with this and they would say, well, they're adults, you know, what can I do? You're right. They are. And ultimately they're going to make their own decisions and they're going to walk away from their faith and from church if they want to, but don't stop being their parent. If, if you have to be the nuisance in their life that keeps calling them back to Jesus, then keep being that nuisance. Um, because just as you did when they were babies, because it was for their spiritual and eternal good, none of that changes, whether they're four weeks old or they're 40 years old. Okay. Um, so we, we don't treat baptism as this, this magic charm, that it's the last thing we do. Um, we baptize and then we spend the rest of our lives teaching that faith, the faith given to them in baptism to our children. All right, what questions um, does anyone have? And again, if, if you don't want to ask it in, in the group, uh, send me an email, shoot me a text, stick around afterwards. We can talk more about it, but hopefully that kind of gave you enough to, to chew on. Good so far? All right, let's get into then... Um, I've just got a couple frequently asked questions. We'll do this for Holy Communion too. Um, it became common enough that I heard these questions kind of year after year in teaching this class that it was like, you know what? I'm just going to put them in the lesson because maybe, you know, obviously people are going to have these every time we go through it, but maybe it's going to be a class where nobody has the courage to ask it. So I'm just going to put them in, okay? So here's our, our first question that sometimes people ask. And I referenced it earlier. You know, what happens to babies who die before they are baptized? Um, Mark 16, verse 16, I think is a, is a good verse that, that addresses this. Um, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, so it's, it's really asking the question this, is baptism necessary for salvation? Um, and the way that we answer that question, and I realize it's, it's maybe not... Um, a great way to answer it. But again, we our goal is always to say what scripture says. And so what I would say is this, never treat baptism as if it is an optional thing. The Bible does not leave that as an option. Um, you know what? Believe and be baptized if you want to. Um, Christ's command is to, is to baptize, to be baptized. Um, and, and, and yet, what happens then in a situation where you've got someone maybe who's not rejecting baptism, like a stillborn child, right? The parents of a stillborn child, um, but the, 
the, the sacrament of baptism, the act of baptism was not able to be done for that child. I think the second, second half of that, that passage tells us, it does not say, but whoever does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. Um, and so there is great comfort there that while we, we talk about baptism as something that is not optional, we don't talk about it in such a way that says, outside of baptism, there is no salvation. We do say, as scripture says, outside of saving faith in Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Because that's all scripture gives us. So, so here's my, my non-answer. What happens to babies who die before they're baptized? Well, skirt it. The Bible doesn't answer this question. It doesn't give us a specific answer. Here's what happens to babies who die before they're baptized. It doesn't answer it. All we can say is that God commanded us to use baptism in his grace and wisdom. Um, he may know the intent to have a child baptized and work faith in that infant's soul who dies unexpectedly. Obviously, parents want to have their children baptized as soon as possible. The baptism cannot be conducted in a church service within a few weeks. A private baptism at the church or in the home can be arranged. Um, I have had two parents baptize their babies in the hospital before I could get there uh, because it was an emergency baptism, premature birth. The parents called me and said, we're rushing to the hospital. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I said, uh, if the child is born before I get there, please baptize your baby. And they did. And both of those kids survived and are doing well today. Um, but it's not the kind of thing where it's like, if a pastor doesn't do it, then it's not real. Um, so God forbid you're ever in that situation. But if you are, now you know what to do. Baptize your child. Okay. Um, don't wait for me to get there. Um, so I would say another another portion to this, again, is, is exactly kind of what we talked about before. Two things. I would say, number one, um, faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard through the word of Christ. Um, make sure that even while in the womb, your child is hearing the word of God. The Holy Spirit is working faith. This is a part of the reason why we don't dismiss children out of our church service. Why we don't have something like children's church. I know. It's hard to focus sometimes. Kids are rowdy. They're loud. They're distracting. I get it. But please understand and recognize that they need to be in the word as much as you are. And they, even if they're goofing off, they are there. They're hearing it. The Holy Spirit is working on them. And they learn the faith. They learn the divine service from watching you, mom and dad. Not by, not by going off somewhere and screwing around and playing and saying, well, we brought our kids to church, but they weren't actually with us for church. Um, have your kids show them what, what you're doing and what you're saying and, and teach them the creed in your home and teach them the Ten Commandments and teach them the Lord's Prayer. Um, those, those precious things, and then they can participate in the service and they know that they're a part of the body of Christ because they are. The second thing that I would say is this. Um, remember who it is that judges. Um, if you're worried about a child who died and yet you weren't able to baptize it, um, that was obviously a decision that the Lord himself had blessed. And now you entrust that child into the hands of whom? The most merciful and gracious God. Um, so I've had this situation a couple times. Um, and, and I have made sure that I, I do not let those parents leave wondering. Right? Well, we didn't get to baptize it, so who knows? I guess it'll be a surprise on Judgment Day whether or not your unborn child made it into heaven. No. No. Um, take comfort. Right? That, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood even for this one. And I don't know why the Lord allowed this thing to happen to you and your family. Um, but I know that this is the God who wants all people saved. Um, and if he called that child to himself prior to us being able to do what God commanded us to do to impart these blessings, then here's the comfort I take from that. It's because God already has. Okay. 
All right, number two, um, who should perform baptisms? Um, we we, we kind of looked at that one just a little bit already. Um, yeah, typically, this is the, 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 the responsibility of a pastor. It is um, the greatest thing that I get to do. Um, so while I know that, that some of you um, might say, I want to baptize my own children, I get that. Um, I, I did not baptize my first child um, because I wanted our pastor. I was an associate pastor. I had the other pastor uh, baptize um, my, my, uh, my first child because I wanted to see that happen. I wanted to know that this is the, the pastor for my family. Um, and I want to be able to hear those words and those questions that are asked of parents at, a, at an infant baptism, right? Do you realize what this is? Do you make the promise to continue to, to teach, to train, and instruct? Um, and that was my plan for however many other ki kids that we had. And then we moved here, and I was the only pastor. And so I baptized our last two children. Um, but, but I didn't do it because this is my role as a father. I did it because uh, they, were, they were children of this congregation. Um, and so it is the greatest responsibility and, and privilege that I get to, to baptize people. Um, and so I would ask that this is one of the things the congregation has called me here to do on its behalf. And so we, we, we do that typically. But again, if we're talking an emergency situation, kind of an abnormal situation, um, your baptizing your child in the hospital is not less valid than my baptizing your child in a church service. Okay. Water. Name of the triune God, baptism. Okay. So do that um, if necessary. All right. <clears throat> are sponsors or godparents necessary for a baptism? Uh, no, there, there's no Bible verse here because it doesn't really talk about that in the Bible. This kind of became uh, a tradition and a practice early on in the Christian church, really early on, actually, um, in the Roman Empire when Christianity was outlawed. If you had people who wanted um, to start learning about the Christian faith, you know, you imagine like a small, maybe two, three families were gathering quietly in someone's home and they were kind of doing their own church service. They were reading the scriptures and they were teaching the faith to one another and to their children. And uh, one of their neighbors, you know, goes, hey, um, you know, I heard you guys are, are practicing Christianity. Can I get in on that? That can potentially be a life or death question, right? Are they genuinely interested or are, is this someone looking to out us to the Roman government and have all of us slaughtered? The purpose then of having a sponsor was somebody who said, no, I know this person. I vouch for them. They are genuinely interested in the Christian faith. I'm going to serve in that role of being a sponsor. And it kind of just continued through. Um, <clears throat> I think you can probably trace this, this role of godparents as well. Um, you know, early on through even, you know, kind of the Middle Ages, um, when the, the uh, uh, mortality rate for adults, like the, you know, if you, if you hit the age of 40, you hit the jackpot, right? So if you're, you're raising your children and you're not going to be around that long, right, to, to assign or ask people to step in, not just to physically take care of your children, but to spiritually do that, right, I think was just as important. So, it's not a necessary thing. You don't have to have sponsors. You don't have to have godparents. Um, I think there's there's benefits to it. Um, our kids for the longest time did not have godparents. They've only had them for a couple of years because Missy and I couldn't agree on them. Um, and so, you know, uh, that didn't change the validity of their baptism. Um, she came around to my side, and uh, uh, but it took a long time. So uh, now now they they do. Um, question number four, um, if someone is baptized in another Christian church and later became a member of the Lutheran church, does that person need to be baptized again? A um, couple of important verses here, Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is only one baptism. We only baptize once. And so you, if you have been baptized in a previous Christian church that used water and baptized you in the name of the triune God, you are baptized. Even if your understanding 
of baptism has now changed and evolved. And you go, well, now I really get what baptism's all about. Now I would like to be baptized. I'm going to tell you no. Not because I don't want you to have the benefits and, and blessings of baptism. Because again, if baptism is what the Bible says it is, if it's God making a promise to you, if it's God doing X, Y, and Z for you, then to be baptized again would be you saying, God, when you made those promises to me the first time, it didn't stick. Even if you didn't realize the, the, the full beauty of what God was doing for you in baptism, he was. Now you know it. Now you understand it. God be praised. But to, to baptize you again would be to say that somehow God had failed. And I'm not going to do that. Now, rejoice in your baptism. Right? Know that you never, you never need to go through that again. Um, that God has got you. Okay? Um, uh, another, another good passage oh, is, um, I've got it there in the bottom of the page, Isaiah 54, though the mountains be shaken, the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. The point of that is that God is faithful. Right? Um, However, I will say, um, and this was a big thing uh, when I was in Salt Lake City, especially, um, just because you have undergone something called baptism doesn't necessarily mean you've been baptized. Um, so, you know, um, I don't know if I'm going to get booted off of YouTube for this, but um, Mormons are not Christian. They're not. They're, they're not. They don't believe in the triune God. They don't hold to the, the Christian uh, um, um, creedal confession. Um, and, and therefore, even though Mormons go through a thing called baptism, even though it uses water, um, it is not a Trinitarian faith and it is not a Trinitarian baptism. So when I would get people who would come through this class and they would say, oh, I was baptized Mormon when I was eight or whenever they do it, and, they, and I would say, you've never been baptized. So, so even if you've undergone something in some sort of religious setting that had the label baptism on it, understand and recognize um, you might not have undergone that one baptism, the true biblical baptism, okay? Um, so if you're questioning or wondering, um, whether or not your 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 baptism was legit, come and see me, talk to me. Um, but I would say more than likely, if it was in a Christian church, Roman Catholic or uh, Baptist or you know Presbyterian or you know any other number of, of Christian denominations, um, those are are Trinitarian baptisms. Those are legit baptisms, right? Um, even if you know they they made you wait until you accepted Christ or did all of those things, and you now see. You know, it was all God's doing and not mine. That still was a legit baptism. Um, and as confessional Lutherans, we always catch heat um, for for practicing private or uh, for, for practicing closed communion. Well, you don't commune everybody. But nobody gives us credit that we, we, we accept more baptisms than anyone else. Meaning, um, if, if you were baptized um, in a Lutheran church and then later on wanted to join the Roman Catholic Church, they would ask you, were you baptized into the Roman Catholic Church? And you would have to say, no, I wasn't. And then they would say, well, you're not really baptized. You'll have to be baptized again into the Roman Catholic Church. Um, if you were baptized as a baby in a, in a Lutheran church, and then later on wanted to join a Baptist church, and they would say, have you been baptized? And you would say, yeah, I was baptized when I was uh, four days old. They would say, you've never been baptized. That wasn't a real baptism because you hadn't chosen Christ. You didn't know what was going on. Now you've got to be baptized again. There is no such thing as a Lutheran baptism. You are not baptized Lutheran. Don't say that. I'm baptized. There's no such thing. You're either baptized or you're not. Okay. Um, you're not baptized into the Lutheran church. You're not baptized into Prince of Peace. You're not baptized into, you're baptized into Christ. Or you're not. I don't care where it happened or who did it. Was there water? was the name of the triune God put on you, then you're baptized. And everything that we've talked about is yours. Okay. Make sense? All right. Rant over.
Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through, although I, I, I would like to, but for, for the sake of time, um, page 67 includes the, the four questions and the four parts of baptism from the small catechism. I really would encourage you, you see how short it is. I really would encourage you to read through the, the, the beautiful simplicity of those answers, because all of those is what we have gone through in this lesson. We probably could have saved ourselves a week plus by just going through that page, but I wanted to give you a little more meat, I would say. Um, but but all of those are the answers to the questions about baptism, okay? And I love that each one of those questions, what is baptism? What does baptism do for us? How can water do such great things? What does baptizing with water mean? Um, Martin Luther gives his answer and then immediately follows it up with, yeah, but where is that written in the Bible? Because it doesn't matter what Martin Luther says. It doesn't matter what Lutherans say. It matters what scripture says. And so he follows each one of those answers up with, here's where we get that answer from in scripture. All right. Okay. Here is our summary and our close. God is generous with his grace. Not only does he tell us about his love and forgiveness in his word, but he also shows us his grace through sacred acts called sacraments. Our definition of a sacrament is something that offers the forgiveness of sins instituted by Jesus, is connected with God's word, and uses an earthly element. Baptism is one of the sacraments Jesus has given his church. In Christian baptism, water is applied to a person in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through baptism, God forgives our sins creates and strengthens faith, and gives us eternal life. Baptism is for infants, children, and adults alike. Baptism is especially comforting in the case of a young baptized child who dies at an early age, because we know that God uses baptism to create faith in that child's heart and to assure us that the child is in heaven. Baptism is also a comfort to us throughout our lives because it is God's pledge of his love and mercy to us every day. Finally, baptism strengthens me to live a thankful and godly life in appreciation the spiritual blessings Christ has given us. Um, in our worship life on the bottom there, it just kind of walks you through the, uh, the, the baptismal rites in the front of the hymnal, kind of how do we do. It, baptism is just as simple as having some water and saying to someone, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's also in kind of the context of a church is um, it's always an opportunity to teach everyone and to remind everyone what is baptism what does this mean for me i hey i'm baptized these all of these promises are mine in christ hey i'm not baptized what does it mean here's what it means right so there's a number of things that we kind of go through uh, in in addition to to simply pouring water someone over someone's uh water over someone's head in the name in the name of the triune god um the one that i want to point out here um is uh, oftentimes you will see people in our church services throughout uh, the divine service make the sign of the cross. And I want to explain to you very briefly why that is. Because I know what many, if not all of you are thinking, that's Roman Catholic. And I'm telling you right now, it's not. There are a lot of things that we can attribute to Roman Catholicism. Um, and most of those things, we want to stay in Roman Catholicism. This is kind of the whole reason why the Lutheran Reformation happened, because they're not biblical things. But there are also things that Roman Catholics do that are for all Christians. And when they are biblical, and when they are, are solidly, confessionally traditional, they are not things that we should just reserve to Roman Catholicism and not take for ourselves. And one of those, I would say, is making the sign of the cross. I impose this on no one. I force no one. But I want you at least to be educated as to why this is done and what it means. Um, if you have been baptized, I don't know that every branch of Christianity does it. But Roman Catholicism does, and every Lutheran church that I've ever known also does. That when you are baptized, Part of that baptismal rite is the pastor saying to you, receive the sign of the cross over your head and heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. It is that sign of the cross 
that is now placed on you in baptism as a reminder and connection to Jesus Christ. Um, it's a connection to Romans chapter 6. And so when I, as a pastor, stand in front of the congregation and multiple times during the service make the sign of the cross, I, I'm not doing it because I'm bored and I'm looking for something to do with my hands. I'm doing it as a visual reminder of your baptism. That this is what was placed on you in your baptism. So in the absolution, when I say, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, what I'm telling you is this is not a new forgiveness that I'm giving you that you've never had before. I'm reminding you that this is who you are. Um, you are a baptized child of God. Um, and so what, what individuals in our congregation do then when that happens is they are taking that general blessing intended for the congregation and they're making it theirs. And so what I tell people is if this is something that is beneficial for your spiritual life, um, to, to, to uh, say something when you are saying it. Some people in their minds or even, you know, will verbalize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to remind themselves who they are. I am a baptized child of God. Um, Martin Luther in the small catechism begins each section and says um, that when you begin and end each day, you make the sign of the cross and you tell yourself in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it's a reminder that when I begin my day, I begin it as a baptized child of God. And when I lay my head down at night, I do so as a baptized child of God. Um, it is a visual reminder of the promises God made to you at your baptism. Um, so you can do this when I make the sign of the cross. You can do it as the spirit moves you. Um, you can do it when you hear a reference to the name of the triune God. Um, you can do it when you hear a blessing or a promise that God is, is, has made during the service. You can do it when you pray um, on your own, um, when you're doing Bible study in your house. Whenever, whenever it, it, you know, it seems beneficial to you, you can do it. You don't have to do it. But I at least don't want you leaving this class thinking, I can't do it because I'm not Roman Catholic. It's not theirs. Don't let them get it. Don't let them keep it. They can keep a lot of things. They don't get to keep the good stuff to themselves. And I would say this is one of those good things. Okay. So if it's something you want to do, or if you've ever wondered why do people in a Lutheran church do that, that's why. It's because I teach everyone uh, when it comes to baptism, this is something you, by virtue of your baptism, have every right to do. And if it's a beneficial thing for you to do, to, to have that visual reminder that this is mine, this is who I am, then by all means do it. If it's not, don't, don't sweat it. Okay? All right. Um, any questions?